Greetings Kerbonauts! This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch and this is a tutorial on Remote Tech 2. So first of all I'm using uh, Kerbal Space Program version 0.22 and this is Remote Tech 2 version 1.21. So what this mod does is it allows you to control your unmanned craft as if it were real life. Like if you were sending something up and you had to communicate with it through relays and uh, direct communication lines, satellite dishes, that sort of thing. And so this mod adds a couple antennas, maybe three antennas, something like that. We'll look in the vehicle assembly building and we'll see how many it adds. And some satellite dishes, they have various ranges, they have a slightly different functionality. The antenna allows you to communicate in any direction, but it has a shorter range than a satellite dish. Satellite dish is uh, you have to link them up one to another but uh, then they have a much longer range so that's what you would use to go to other planets and things like that when you're just flying around Kerbin you want to use the antenna but before we continue with this first launch of my satellite system let's go into the vehicle assembly building and take a look at what's new alright here we are in the vehicle assembly building and you can see over here I have used my simple part filter to filter out so that we're just showing the remote tech 2 stuff if you go through all the tabs, you'll see that only the science tab here has anything new. It has these three antennas, so I was right, it was three antenna, and four satellite dishes. Of course, if I filter back on here to get my squad parts, they have also automatically added the functionality to the default stuff, like the communitron, uh, the dish, the antenna, and this other dish over here. So all of that stuff automatically will handle remote tech too. Uh, also, they have automatically added the extra module required to make all of these parts um, able to communicate within the network because to make this thing work you have to have something that has a, um, act, a normal signal processing unit like what would be included in here so you don't have to do anything you just use one of these and it automatically will be able to receive its communications but you also need the passive type of signal processor which comes from having one of the antenna or a satellite dish uh, once you have those, then you can put yourself in and make it part of that network of all the satellites and you can bounce signals back and forth and it ends up looking really cool out there on the map when you see all the lines going. We'll see some of that later in this tutorial. First, let's take a look at uh, what you're going to need to do to actually set up this network. So I've created this here. Let's pretend that this is Kerbin right here and these are three satellites. Now, of course, I'm using three satellites because you can't use just one. Things on the dark side wouldn't be able to communicate. You can't use two because the satellites would be opposite each other around Kerbin, and they wouldn't be able to see each other to bounce signals. You need three satellites to be able to bounce signals around and make it all the way in uh, to mission control. Now, let's put this antenna right here, and let's pretend that that is mission control. So if you have a satellite up here, let's say this is a satellite orbiting around the planet, and th this line represents our uh, altitude away from Kerbin. So maybe this one right here can communicate, but notice that uh, this satellite can't see this satellite because of the horizon. So obviously you're going to have to bring these out to an, a higher altitude. Let's turn on some symmetry here. Uh, you need to bring these out to a higher altitude to the point where you know, maybe that's not quite enough to actually still see. So we go higher altitude still. And then finally you get out here and now, see that? You can cross there, it can cross there. So at this altitude and this little sample, uh, these satellites would be able to communicate with each other and whichever one was able to see mission control at that time would be able to bounce a signal there. So if you have some satellite over here, it bounces a signal to this one, to this one, and then down to mission control, and everything's great. And if these things are rotating around, it's changing whichever one is actually doing the communicating to mission control, but that doesn't really matter. Now why am I saying as these things are changing, rather than assuming that we're just going to put these at geosynchronous orbit? Well, that's because I'm taking the approach that this is a career mode game. I figure if we're looking at career mode, then anybody who's not using career mode, they're going to be fine. They have access to everything in the sandbox. But if you're in career mode, you need to take into consideration a couple special things. Uh, one of them is that your first antenna, this Communitron 16, is not active by default. So you're actually not going to be able to start off a game like what I wanted to do 
I wanted to do um, send up Sputnik first and send up a communications satellites or something like that before I actually go to unmanned craft. Uh, that's not possible, however, if you use this stock. I, in order to get that to happen, I had to edit my uh, tech tree to bring down one of the other antenna and make it available at the starting level. Because if you look at here, you see that it says Omni range 2.5 million, but it doesn't say that it's on by default which means if you stick anything out there that you think is going to be a brand new satellite and you expect to communicate with it without a command pod, that's not going to work. It's going to say it's not part of the communications network because it's not on by default. And to get it on, you need to have a signal to it. But to have a signal to it, you have to have an antenna. So you get in this weird catch-22 where you can't actually do it. What you need to do is work your way up through the tech tree and I've cheated myself here a bunch of extra science just so I can show you what the, this tech tree is like in this fresh game. I'll uh, say we, we research that and then you come down here to survivability you research that and then you can get yourself to flight control. Flight control has the Reflectron DP-10. Notice that one says Omni range 500 kilometers but activated by default. So this is the one you need. Once you have this level researched now you can put out something that does not have a Kerbal in it. You attach this antenna to it, which allows you to then access the antenna that you started with. And now you can actually launch your unmanned craft because that antenna turns on that antenna. And that antenna has the range that you need to make it work. Alrighty, back to the vehicle assembly building where I finish off describing what we need to do in order to get this communications network started. So we left off where we knew that we had three satellites that we had to put up, but the next question is what altitude? So we just looked at career mode and you know that we have the DP-10, uh, so that needs to be on every single satellite. That one allows us to activate the Communitron 16, although you don't want to activate that until you're out of the atmosphere. Notice it says snaps under high dyna dynamic pressure right there. If you try to turn that thing on while you're still launching, it'll blow right off of your craft. Uh, so you want to wait until you're up out of the atmosphere. This has the 600 kilometer, 500 kilometer range, so you're going to be fine. Um, just get up high enough, then you can activate this, and then you've got your 2.5 million, and you'll be fine. Uh, but what altitude? Well, we again still cannot do geosynchronous orbit because that is at two point, over 2.8 million kilometers and this only has a range of 2.5 million. Well, what is the right range? Okay, so it works like this. Let's say we have our satellite down too low. We already know that the horizon would make it impossible. See that one over there on the right? I can't even see it right here. So we know it's impossible once we're too low. We can't go too high or else they'll be out of range with each other. The altitude where this comes out to being just enough to see the other satellite over there is the altitude that we're going to want to have. Kerbin, if you remember, from the middle to the edge out to like mission control is 600 kilometers. If we just tack on an extra, say, 50 kilometers, then we should have enough range. So between here and here would be 600, and then out to the line here would be 650. If you look down from up here, we see that this would create a right triangle. Uh, take the center and imagine a line that goes out to the satellite. Imagine another line that comes out to the line that's formed between the two satellites. And right here, this is a right triangle in this quadrant. There are six right triangles around this whole thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's 360 degrees in a circle. Divided by six means the angle over here at Kerbin is 60 degrees. A 60 degree angle here where we know this side is 650 kilometers allows us to use some trig to calculate what the length is of the line over here as well as the line over here. And if we know this line over here, then we know the altitude that we're trying to get. It's going to be whatever the length of this line is minus the 600 kilometers of Kerbin. So this portion is our altitude. And we can figure that out by knowing that the cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse of a right angle there. Uh, so 
650 being this one over here and cosine of 60 degrees is one half so that just means we're going to double whatever the length is over here. If this is 650 then twice that is 1300 kilometers. So this whole length over here is 1300 kilometers. Take out the 600 kilometers of Kerbin from here to here and this altitude from here to the satellite is 700 kilometers. So if we put three satellites equidistant from each other on a circle at 700 kilometers, then we should have a communications network that's capable of bouncing everything it needs to in every direction and uh, still being in within the range of the 2.5 million. Because if we know this angle is 1300 kilometers and this one is 650 kilometers, then using the Pythagoras theorem, we can calculate the length of just half of this distance between these two satellites. The Pythagoras theorem says that the sum of the squares of the two sides is going to be equal to the square of the hypotenuse. And the two sides, one of them is 650 kilometers, the hypotenuse is 1300 kilometers. We square those, subtract the one from the other, take the square root of that result, and we have the length of the half of that one side of that triangle. That was only half of it, so we double that, and that gives us a distance of 2.252 million meters in between the two satellites, or in between any of the two satellites along any edge of that whole three-sider there that goes around Kerbin. And so we know because of the 2.5 million range of that antenna that we're going to be well within the range of the satellites to be able to see each other. So right here, we're back out at this launch, and I am targeting specifically 700 kilometers on my apoapsis there in the bottom right corner. I'm not using MechJab other than for instrumentation, but that's the MechJab add-on that's allowing me to see that orbital parameter. Now, if you've been paying attention while this launch is going on, watching this craft, you'll notice that the way that I flew it was a little different from what you might normally expect to see. Uh, normally, you in stock Kerbal would go up to about 10 kilometers and then roll over and go at an angle about 45 degrees until you get out of the atmosphere, then roll again and flatten it out to circularize your orbit, maybe 70 or 100 or whatever it is that you like your altitude to be. I'm in Ferrum Aerospace. You can see in the upper left-hand corner there, the FAR indicator shows. I'm using Ferrum. I'm also using Deadly Reentry. Uh, because of using those, I can actually turn over almost immediately. Uh, maybe get up to, say, 100 meters per second speed, and then I roll over, and I'm already heading off at an angle because the aerodynamic model is much more realistic than in stock, and uh, that's how regular rockets fly is they they immediately try to take advantage of that gravity turn so anyway yeah but I didn't do that in this well that's because you also have to in this with the remote tech and the antenna range have to keep in mind that if you go over the horizon while you're launching your first satellite you're actually gonna lose control of it uh, it will not have a direct line of sight and it needs that direct line of sight even though I've got that long-range antenna sticking out there it needs that direct line of sight to mission control until we have our whole satellite network up. And for that reason, I went straight up and then rolled over so that my apoapsis here, when we get it up to the 700 kilometers we're targeting, it will uh, still be over mission control. You can see down there, I'm still looking at the peninsula. If I had rolled over earlier, I'd be way over over the other continent by now. Uh, yeah, this uses a lot more fuel, but I put a lot of fuel on this craft. Um, this isn't a stock. I've got a bunch of mods on here. I've got some big tanks. I get different types of engines. Uh, it's, this is technically not a career mode one that we're looking at here. I showed you the career mode tech tree, but this isn't career mode. I did this one uh, just to show off uh, my satellites. Uh, this is one of my three satellites. I'm going to show two other satellites by the time we're done with this because we need the three satellites, and so I made three different satellites for the three different launches. Anyway, we're getting close to where uh, this one is reaching its 700K, and then it's going to deploy. While we wait for that, a couple things. One is remember to put out that antenna when you're first launching. You want to get over the atmosphere, uh, still be within the 500 kilometers of the automatically deployed antenna, but then deploy that other longer range antenna. Uh, that I did that at the same time that my solar panels were coming out. 
Uh, the second thing is once we have our 700 kilometers altitude here and we're trying to circularize, you're not really trying to get it exactly 700 apo, 700 peri. It just needs to be close. We're not really going to be paying attention to what those are at the very end. We're going to be looking at our orbital period. Now, if you can get an add-on like MechJab or uh, like Kerbal Engineer, those things will show you your orbital period. There, I moved my window up there in the bottom right so you can see my orbital period right now. I'm getting close to where I want to circularize. And I'm going to go for that 700, but I'm really actually going to try to get a consistent orbital period between all three satellites. If I can put them equidistant with the same orbital period, even if their actual orbital parameters like the periapsis and apoapsis aren't perfectly the same in sync with each other, but if that orbital period is the same, they'll all be moving at the same rate, which means they'll all relatively closely keep that distance in between themselves so they won't all uh, stack up on top of each other. Um, I noticed one time when I was doing a uh, geosynchronous orbit that I was trying to hit that 2.86 whatever million meters that it's supposed to be and I put out my three satellites and I had them at what I thought was the exact uh, orbital parameters that I needed for the apoapsis, periapsis were really close and they over time would they would st stack up on each other and uh, that was because I wasn't paying attention to my orbital period um, what I really needed to do is make sure that that period was exactly six hours now in this case I can't target six hours while we watch our satellite here deploying. See those uh, little sides flip out there. The solar panels for the actual satellite come out. Um, anyway, the uh, orbital period here, I can't go for six hours because I'm not at geosynchronous. We're only at 700K. So what I'm going to do is target one hour, 23 minutes because that's about what it is. Um, I just wanted to round it so I didn't have any seconds to deal with. Uh, and the way that I achieve that is you use the regular engine here to get yourself up to the uh, periapsis of 700k. But then you finish off your orbit by turning on some RCS. And if you've hit the caps lock key, then you can do, be in fine tuning mode. And the RCS, when you press either H to go forward or N to go backward, as long as you're pointing on your prograde vector, uh, it will go very, very little, just a couple seconds worth of orbital parameter at a time, sometimes just one second or even half a second, depends on how light you are on the touch. And uh, so what you do there is you get it close. You can see we're, we're actually getting really close right here. One hour, 21 minutes. Uh, get that up to about 23 minutes. And then um, I keep myself on that prograde vector. Uh, notice I'm completely ignoring that node marker, the blue node marker. I don't care about that now. I'm close enough. What I want is the prograde. And so we get to that one, point, uh, one hour, 23 minutes, and then tap on the RCS. And that gets the orbital period to exactly 123 and zero seconds. If you go a little too far in one direction, tap on the other. The keys are H and N, H to go forward, N to go retro. And you get that and then we'll go off and we'll launch our second satellite and begin the network. I am ready to launch my second satellite, but I want to make sure that I get it in the right spot. If you remember, here's ComSat 1, and the other one, another one that I want to launch is going to want to be somewhere around over here where it would reach beyond the edge of Kerbin and go maybe right about there. Then the next one is probably right about there and then it can communicate back to this one. So to get it to launch right here, I think we're a little bit early if we launch right now, because generally speaking with these straight up launches, uh, you're going to end up very close to whatever it was that's right above you at the time. Uh, so I want this location to be a little bit more over here. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer. We'll let that satellite move. And let's see, right about right about there should be good. Okay, so now we're going to launch this satellite and uh, put it up, and, and it'll be the one that goes in this position. Once again, we cannot do, like I said, go. We can't do the normal 10k turnover or even the 1k ferrum aerospace turnover. We need to keep going straight up and up and up and so I'm just going to let this thing go to quite a high altitude before we even begin thinking of 
turning it over. Uh, the only thing we'll do is we'll um, deploy a part of the satellite and get the antenna out when we can. Meanwhile, taking a look out here, you can see that I have the add-on that adds the nice city lights and the beautiful clouds over Kerbin makes it much nicer. Get rid of those boosters, don't need those anymore. And uh, we'll continue working our way out of the atmosphere here. Uh, in the upper left corner, you can see there is this flight computer that's part of Remote Tech 2. Uh, this gives you orbital control um, from a distance if you're going to use the uh, signal delay. Signal delay is where you have to wait for the speed of light for your communications to get wherever they're going. And uh, that can be in the order of minutes in the real world. You know, something trying to command something on Mars, for example, it can take a little while for that, that signal to get there. And that simulation is on by default in uh, RT2, I believe, in this 1.21. If you have earlier than 1.21, I think maybe in 1.10 or even 1.20, uh, they didn't have that turned on yet, but now it's on. Um, anyway, these, uh, these controls over here are very similar to what's on in my MacJeb. I have Smart SAS that I can use. See, it's very similar. So I'm used to this. I'm probably going to continue using this. I don't think I'm going to use the flight computer. In fact, I'm probably going to turn off the signal delay. I like realism. I don't know that I like realism quite that much. Um, okay, so getting back here, this thing has run out of fuel in the bottom stage. So we're going to decouple that and begin to deploy the satellite. So this is my satellite number two, all packaged up nicely inside there. We'll get that out as soon as this bottom stage is completely out of fuel. Uh, let's bring up the antenna. So I just hit the hotkey that opens the antenna inside because I don't want to lose that. And I'm going to keep going up here until we get to a higher altitude. So out here you can see that I'm um, still working my way up. What I want to do is I want to get this close to the other orbit with that satellite. And it's looking pretty good so far. I think I'm going to have to adjust the inclination eventually. Um, we'll do that once we get out a little bit higher. We'll be slower once we're up here. The higher you go, the slower you're going. And the slower you're going, the less expensive it is to adjust something like your inclination. For now, I think we will fast forward until we get to some more interesting parts of this action. Well, I interrupted my making of this just now because I wanted to revert actually back to remote tech 110. I had just today noticed that 121 was installed. I thought before making this video that uh, I had been using 110. I thought, oh, I'll go check and see if there's a new one and I'll install that and make sure I cover that. Well, it doesn't seem to be working very well for me. Uh, the 121, anytime I throttle down, um, the engine just keeps on spurting, like it, it just fluctuates back and forth, doing thrust and going in crazy directions. And so I don't really need the 121 features. I was happy with 110, it was fine. I'm just going to revert back to that and continue this tutorial using that version. Okay, so here we were. I was about to deploy this satellite, um, got ourselves around into the right orbit and relative to the sun. So. Now, let's just get this thing opened up. Have some arms there with my dishes. I have my antenna on some extra arms that come out like that. The RCS to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the inner workings of everything. Uh, it's on its own little arms that make it stick out to let me fine-tune later on. We get our solar panels out so that they don't interfere with anything when they want to rotate and face the sun. 
give them a little tilt as well make our dishes come out and the solar panels all right so there is satellite number two uh, the only problem is it's at one hour 24 minutes 10 seconds like I said I was having some issues with remote tech wanting to uh, keep the engines on even after I throttled it down so I should be fine in 110 though because I have been using that for a while and I've really liked it so we'll stick with that do a little retro burn to take off some of that extra velocity that it was adding on me and then we'll turn on the RCS and fine-tune it get it down to 123 and 7 seconds four three two a little tapping on the H key here and there we go one hour 23 minutes the second satellite is now in place it's time to launch our third if we launch the third satellite while the other satellites are above us then that means we don't have to worry quite as much about going straight up we'll be able to bounce our signal off of one of these other two so I'm actually going to do that this time Here's number three, and let's get this one started. I'm pretty close to the right spot now I'm just going to deploy this satellite because it, it can be a little hard to maneuver with the gigantic fuel tank on the bottom and it's almost out of fuel and I have plenty in the upper in the satellite itself to make this uh, get this finished off so let's decouple that and we'll deploy my little pineapple flower satellite here That opens all the way up, exposing my RCS. And then we get our solar arms to stick out here. Extend those, get the power going. Bring the antenna out. We have an antenna there and we have an antenna there. They don't really need it to be like that but I think it's kind of cool to bring the antenna out and make it stick up like that and then finally we need to deploy the actual dish which I have nothing to target it to because this is a huge dish that goes very far away like out to ELU but I'm not sending any ELU missions right now it's just to show off a satellite so there's satellite number three we need to get that one put into its proper orbit still out here you can see that they're all really close to each other and I'm going to do the same thing that I did before the orbital period is still well under the one hour 23 minutes so it's going to be moving faster and faster on this orbit until it gets out to about here and once it's in communication with all three satellites then I'll slow it down and uh, we will circularize it there getting close I saw it there for a second so 
I might have been going the wrong way. Oh, that is Consat 3. I'm going too fast. I need to slow back down again and bring it back over to this area. Okay, so that's going to require a retro burn to speed things up. I'm going to use my Smart ASS just to quickly get it over to that retro marker. And we'll just finish this off real quick. Oh, what am I thinking? It's a prograde burn. I need to slow down. All right, that's three minutes faster than the others are moving. So that should get us slowed down into the right spot. Okay, it's pretty close. Just for the purpose of having this done, I'm going to pick a place where they seem to be overlapping a bit, which is right there. And I'm going to make that orbit try to fit a little closer to the other ones. That's pretty close. I'm going to use my RCS now and we will adjust that down by 24 more seconds in retro. And that's it. One hour, 23 seconds. We now have three satellites. Uh, it's not exactly able to communicate. If I were really doing this properly, I would get that a little bit further along the orbit. I would have it be able to communicate on both sides. Um, but technically, this should work too, because any satellite that is uh, anywhere out here, like if something were over here, it would be able to see one of these two satellites, and then those are in turn still connected. They're just not connected to each other, but they are connected in a network. So this is close enough just for this uh, quick example. I don't want to spend forever trying to fine tune this. We've set up a lot of antenna and we've looked at local communications networks, but the one thing we haven't looked at really yet is uh, the dishes and how the dishes work. And you're going to need those in order to do any kind of long range communication. Even going to just moon or minmus and especially to other planets, you will have to have the dish. So this launch is my moon mission. It is uh, something like, I don't know what I'd call it, maybe a network in a box. So on top of that, that launch right there, I have four satellites that will be capable of going into all the different orbits that I might want to be able to provide constant visibility between something here and something back at Kerbin. Technically, I only needed three, but with the symmetry, the way I had it, I ended up with four. So whatever, I have an extra one. Now let's start speeding this up. We'll skip ahead, get ourselves to the moon. Uh, we don't really need to go into how to get there. If you need that, then that's a different tutorial. This one will assume that you know how to get there, and we're just going to set up the network using remote tech. Let's slow this down real quick here for one second because you notice I have to set my dish. So this is how you do that. You click on that little button. It says no target. It gives you a list of targets you can select from. In this case, I have selected Kerbin. Now I could have picked any of my satellites and had a direct communication link between this dish and one of those satellite dishes. If I then switch to that satellite, like here I'm showing one of my satellites, if I switch to that, then I can set the dish back to point over here. Instead, I selected to target Kerbin. What that's going to do is each dish has its own conal range. Uh, some of them are, the bigger ones are very narrow and some of the early ones are very wide. That cone acts, I, I believe so far I've seen that it acts like an antenna uh, if anything else is caught in that cone and is in, on the other end the cone has something, a cone pointing back toward it. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit here out on the map what happens when you select that cone. It shows a couple lines on the map that indicate the direction and the angle of your cone. 
before we can let ourselves get out of communication range, uh, when we head off to Moon, we're going to be pretty far away, we need to point some of these from the communications network at our package that's going off to Moon. Now what we could do is we could select one of these to point directly at the satellite, or we could point it at Moon and hope that whatever we're sending out in that direction happens to be in the cone that we're pointing toward Moon. Or we could, because I have so many dishes on this particular satellite, do both. Uh, technically only we need one. Uh, if I had to pick only one, I would probably pick to point the two dishes directly at each other. But if I had a lot of satellites off at Moon and they were already there, and I could assume that they were going to be in the communications uh, cone of that dish, then I would probably do it that way instead. Let's get this finished off quick and then we'll look at what it's like to see that cone. So right there, see that button right here? When you click that, it gives this little triangle that represents the angle that uh, that satellite is able to see with the cone that we're talking about. So if we had a dish in there and the dish was pointing back in this direction, either at the target or in the cone back to Kerbin, then they'd be able to see each other and communicate. Now for some more fast forwarding while we get to Mun. Uh, when we get there, we're going to have a couple options. If we were only interested in keeping in contact with our satellite, like one satellite that wants to go do some science or something like that, uh, then probably the best thing to do would be to take it around the planet in such a way that it's never blocked by Moon, and also have one back at Kerbin that is in like a polar orbit that's also always able to point back at Moon. In this case, I'm trying to do the same thing that I did at Kerbin where I have multiple satellites that create this network all around it so that if I were to la land anything at an equatorial orbit, uh, then I would be able to reach back to one of those satellites in orbit, which will then bounce it around to the far side, allowing it to communicate back to Kerbin. So now we're going to start putting these three, well, at least three, we're going to put all four of them, I guess, out. I brought four, I might as well, uh, into our orbits around Moon. I'm going to target a 500 kilometer altitude on this one. Uh, Moon is 200 kilometers in radius, so that's technically going to be 700 kilometers from the center, which is a much smaller circle than it is over at Kerbin, uh, even though it's similar altitude. Anyway, you don't need to see me launching four different satellites and putting them all into different orbits, so I'm going to fast forward slash skip ahead on this and just show what it looks like uh, more toward the end. And there it is. The network is complete around Moon. This same basic principle could be used at any planet where you send a few satellites and have them orbit and the dishes can point back here to Kerbin. Or you can just do uh, one or two dishes that point back at Kerbin and then have uh, the other satellites just uh, locally communicate with each other using uh, antenna that are long enough. 
So this spacing at four hours on the orbital period, even though the orbits there, you can see they're not really that great uh, all lined up or anything. Um, you can see here it does maintain its shape fairly well because of that four hour period. And there are all lots of yellow lines going back and forth because I've set all the dishes to communicate uh, directly with any other satellite and back there. So uh, if I had done individual targeting of satellite to satellite, uh, that would uh, only connect up those satellites. You might need to do that if your um, dish uh, uh, cone isn't um, very good for reaching really long distances or something. That's only if you're going very far away, ELU ranges, that kind of thing. Well, that basically wraps it up. I'll just leave you here with a last look at those three satellites that we put up earlier, just in case you want to get some ideas on some cool satellite configurations you could do for your of your own. Uh, I was using in this uh, the, I think it's called Magic Smoke Industries Robotics to do all that articulating stuff. I have some dishes from uh, AIES, parts from KW Rocketry, uh, Cosmos pack, uh, lots of stuff. I had to trim everything down to make it fit in the memory though because it'll crash if you just install everything. Uh, so there you go. I uh, hope you enjoyed your time. Good luck with your Remote Tech 2 satellite network and good luck. Uh, have fun in Kerbal Space Program. Thank you for watching and see you later Kerbonauts.